Okay, hello everybody. This evening's class is going to be about the idea of the veil, the mystery of the veil. Uh, hopefully you can see that text that is um, on the screen. Can everyone see it? Just tell me in the chat box if you can all see it. Yes, okay. All right, very good. So, uh, this is the section that we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. Um, it is a section from this week's Torah reading, Parsha Kitisa, which is in Exodus 34 towards the end. <clears throat> so, um, for those of you who can read Hebrew, you can read it in Hebrew. For those who can't, uh, you have the English over there. I'll just, um, this is a, sort of an ad hoc uh, translation. I didn't um, look at the English translation, so but for my purposes, it's good enough. So <clears throat> um, let me just read it through and explain what the um, what the some of the difficulties are. I assume the sound is okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So um, it begins like this: Aaron and the Israelites gazed at, Mo uh, at Moshe, at Moses, whose face shone. And they were afraid to come close to him. Then when Moshe finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. When he came before God to the tabernacle to speak with, uh, to speak with God, to speak with him, he would remove the veil until after he spoke to the Israelites about that which he had been commanded. And the Israelites saw that Moshe's face shone. He again placed the veil over his face until he came again to speak with God. So the sages point out a very interesting thing over here. The sages, including Rashi, Rashi classic commentator, point out that when Moses spoke to God, he had no veil over his face. And when he spoke to the Jewish people, he also had no veil over his face. But the rest of the time when he wasn't doing one of those two things, speaking to God or speaking to the Israelites, that's when he had the veil on his face. So you could ask the question, why did he need a veil in the first place? I mean, if the reason ostensibly for the veil was because people were afraid to look at him, they couldn't withstand the brightness of his countenance. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't look at him. Uh, clear. So that's when you would put the veil on when people are speaking to him. Obviously, when he's talking to God, we understand why he didn't need a veil. But when he was talking to the people is when he should have had a veil and not when he was on his own. So this whole thing is very strange. In order to be able to understand this and what the veil was all about, what it means, um, we have to just look at the context for a minute. What is the story over here? Now, what had happened was, uh, God had uttered the Ten Commandments. The entire people, all the Israelites, were standing at the bottom of the mountain. The voice of God came, and they heard the first two commandments, and they were so full of fear um, at the sound, the huge, like, overwhelming revelation and this, the huge, overwhelming sound of the voice of God that they fled. And then they were brought back, it says by angels, they were brought back. But in any event, <clears throat> then... Um, the rest of the commandments were said through Moses. And then he goes up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights in order to get the Torah, in order to get the two tablets of stone on which the Torah, the Ten Commandments, were written. Then he comes back. And uh, God tells him, Lech Reid, go down because your people have sinned. And he goes quickly down to the camp and he sees that the people have built a golden calf. Now, there's many explanations of what that is and who built it and what they were doing and so on and so forth. But Moses grabs the, uh, while well, he was holding on to them, the two tablets of stone and he throws them down to the ground, smashes them and then um, deals with the people who were worshiping the golden calf. Um, and then uh, goes back up the mountain to ask for forgiveness. And he comes down again with a second set of tablets 
um, 40 days later. Took him another 40 days. First to get the forgiveness and then to get the tablets, uh, the, the, the tablets rewritten. Now, <clears throat> when he came down the second time, that's when his face shone and everyone was scared to look at him. They couldn't look at him and he had to put the veil on his face. That's the context. Now, let me explain what's going on. Um, I'm going to stop the sharing for a minute. Um, okay, just one minute. Yeah. Okay. All right, fine. So, the um, Kabbalah has some interesting um, insights into this whole situation. What actually had happened? Prior to Moses going and receiving the Torah, receiving the Ten Commandments, and the rest of the uh, written Torah, prior to that, the only revelation that was available, and that is in fact the revelation that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, um, were able to, uh, to attain, the only revelation they were able to attain was through creation. by examining deeply the nature of nature, the nature of creation, by examining deeply the created world and following through how did it come into being and, and so on and so forth, and trying very, in a very deeply to understand that, again, not in a scientific way, but in a uh, divine way, trying, trying to understand the divinity behind it the purpose of it, how godliness manifests itself in the creation and through the creation and so on and so forth, they were able to come to a certain revelation. But that was a revelation of the name Elohim, uh, which um, I will write in the chat here, Elohim. And uh, if anyone, uh, if you read Hebrew, so I'll write it in Elohim. Elohim. Okay? That is the name, the divine name, which is manifested in nature. In fact, the Kabbalists point out that the gematria or the numerical value of the name Elohim is 86. 86. And the numerical value of the word nature, Hateva, Hateva, or uh, if you want to go in Hebrew, um, Hateva is also 86. So whenever you have, this is a, 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 um, a general rule in Kabbalistic thinking, that when you have a common quality, when the number of the, the, the every letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. Therefore, words, when you put the letters together, also have a numerical value. That's called gematria. When words have a similar gematria, so that, that's a sign that there may be an under, there may be, not, not always, but there may be an underlying connection, and it's worth looking at the connection. So the sages of the Kabbalah explain that nature and the name Elohim the name of God as it is manifest, as it's manifested in nature, have the same gematria, have the same numerical value. Therefore, what is nature? Nature is essentially godliness, but brought about in a way of nature. Now, the word nature, hateva, or uh, as we said it here in Hebrew, hateva, is from the basic Hebrew root, meaning the same thing as to be drowned or to be sunk into the water. To ube yamsuf, they drowned in the um, uh, in the sea. So teva, 
is related to the word tub'u. Uh, now, of course, this is, uh, this is all in Hebrew, and this is the sort of linguistic aspect of Kabbalah, which is important to know, because this reveals like the, the, the quality that we're looking for. Nature is godliness sunken into or hidden within the world. It can be revealed, but it needs to be searched out. It's not something that is revealed automatically. It needs work in order to be revealed. However, on Mount Sinai, when the Torah and the Ten Commandments were given to uh, the Jewish people, to the Israelites, so it says there that Vayered Havaya al Har Sinai, God, the transcendent name of God, Havaya, Yudke Vavke, that descended on the mountain and that now became revealed. As God had said to Moses prior to this, I did not make known my transcendent name. In other words, the transcendent aspect of myself, which is symbolized by the name Havaya Yudke Vavke, or in English they sometimes say it is Jehovah, but we, it's an incorrect uh, pronunciation. But anyway, um, so that name of God, which represents it, it, it symbolizes or, or uh, indicates, it indicates, that's the best word, it indicates the transcendent nature, the beyond time and space nature, the infinite nature of God. That's the name that was revealed for the first time at Mount Sinai and revealed to all of the people at the same time, to the entire nation. Prior to that, God could only be accessed through nature. And what can be accessed through nature is God hidden within nature. Why? Because it's a limited revelation. It's not a transcendent revelation. It's not above, beyond time and space. It's clothed within time and space, nature. So that's what happened prior to the giving of the Torah. Only that aspect was revealed, God within nature. And at the time that the Torah was given, now it was possible for a person to achieve a, an infinite revelation, a transcendent revelation. Now, while Moses was up the mountain uh, getting the rest of the Torah, which was all of the Torah from the time of the creation all the way through to the time when they received the Torah was now written down. In other words, all of the stories of Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so on and so forth, up until the, and including the Exodus and the crossing of the sea, that was all written up until this time. That was all written in the Torah that, Mo, that Moses brought down afterwards subsequently, but while he was up there getting the second tablets and so on, while he was up there getting the first tablets, rather, um, the people thought that he had passed away because he didn't come down when they thought he said he would come down, and they saw um, a sort of an apparition of Moses ascending to heaven and disappearing. He was not going to come back, that's what they thought. So they wanted a leader a spiritual leader who would fill the place of Moses, and that was the golden calf. Of course, it was a terrible mistake, and it, was, uh, it wasn't in place of God, and it wasn't worshipped as God. It was worshipped as an intermediary for them to be able to relate to God. But let's not get into the whole sin aspect of it and the golden calf aspect. That's uh, not of interest to me, uh, at least not right now. And um, then, so, having, therefore latched on to this concept of intermediary, the people were no longer able to, in general, were no longer able to, again, achieve that transcendent revelation. As soon as one has an intermediary, the transcendent revelation is no longer available. We're back to nature. Now, when Moses came down from the mountain and he realized what had happened, 
and he smashed the tablets and he had to go back up again and so on and so forth, what he went back up to do was reestablish that transcendent revelation. To reestablish the transcendent revelation. God had said, and that's at the beginning of Parsha, of this week's Parsha Kisisa, my angel will go with you, my presence will no longer be with you, I will send an angel instead. Moses wouldn't accept that. He said, no. Previously, prior to the giving of the Torah, there was only a revelation through nature. Now that the Torah has been given, the, the essential transcendent godliness has been revealed, we cannot go back to square one. We cannot go back to square one. We have to reinstitute this. We can't have an angel going with us, which is just godliness clothed within nature, maybe of a higher order, but nevertheless within nature. We need the essence of godliness to be with us. So he argued and so on and so forth um, until he reestablished that connection. He reestablished forgiveness. He attained forgiveness, and then the, um, the Jewish people, the Israelites, were then able to attain that, um, were able to attain that revelation once again. And this is, in fact, the secret of the veil. Let's just go back for a second to, um, to sharing the screen. There we go. Okay, can everyone see it now? Now, let's explain it again. Let's explain what's happening. Moses, when he spoke to the Israelites, and when he spoke to God, his face shone, and he did not cover that glow with a veil, even though people were afraid to come close to him. In other words, he was saying like this, when I'm speaking to God, there's no need for a veil. There is no veil. When I'm speaking to the people, I am not going to put a veil on my face. I'm not going to put up that barrier. Let the, 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 let the light of God shine forth and the people will understand what it is that they can achieve and what it is that they're missing if they don't um, at, at least attempt to achieve it. If you can see a man of God whose face is glowing with godly light, you know what it is that what the sign, uh, the sign of your achieving the same thing will be. But then when he's not speaking to the Israelites and he's not speaking to God, he puts a veil on his face. In other words, even at a time when there's not a revelation, when one's not in direct communication with God, and when the man, a man of holiness, is not directly communicating with you, with me, with, with his people, that's the time of concealment, the time of a veil, so that's when he puts the veil on his face to tell us that there are now two approaches to realizing godliness. The one is the direct way speaking to God, the transcendent way, the transcendent way of speaking directly to God or the way of the Torah, speaking to God through his teachings, through his Torah. And the other way of communicating with God is through nature. That's what the veil represents. The veil represents the godliness hidden within nature. So when there's direct communication, when there is um, open revelation, when there's open revelation, then there's no need for a veil. There is no veil. When there is a veil, 
then we have to look at what the veil represents, the hiddenness of godliness. Now, it doesn't represent the hiddenness of godliness in a negative way. It just represents a different approach to godliness. At times, we need to be transcendent. At times, we need to dig and look for godliness within the world around us. Sometimes we can transcend the world. Sometimes we've got to be involved with the world. Everybody knows that as the concept of Ratso Veshov, running and returning. In other words, rising up to a higher level and returning to bring that into this world, to bring it into this world. Now, um, at this point in time, are there any questions? Everyone sleeping? <laughs> no questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, Dennis, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, <clears throat> what does this mean? Uh, yeah, so what, is it, what, is, what does this mean? What does it mean for us? Basically, it means the following and the following thing. There are times at which we feel that we are communicating directly. Those are transcendent times. Those are times when the soul feels that it's uplifted and a person is in a higher state of being and he feels that he's achieving something on the spiritual plane and so on and so forth. Hopefully that happens to, um, to all of us. Yeah, veils like a screen, yeah. Um, and at other times there's a certain concealment, there's a hiddenness. Nevertheless, the hiddenness is purposeful. The hiddenness has a purpose. It's not just there to, to, to hide God away, to hide us away from God or whatever. It's there in order that we should look for godliness within the world around us, within the events of the world. In other words, we have to look for what's called hashkacha pratit, individual divine providence, that things happen, they happen for a reason, they happen for a teaching, they happen so that we can learn lessons from them and understand that the world itself also, not only does God transcend the world, but he runs the world. Okay. Uh, Terry asks, how should we regard Moses? I think we should regard Moses as emulating God. That's exactly what God did in the creation. He buried himself, so to speak. He hid himself in the creation initially, and then he revealed himself on Mount Sinai when he gave the Torah. So to Moses, is sometimes in a state of revelation when his face is shining and people are seeing, and at other times he's got his face covered and, uh, and people don't see. He has his face covered with his veil, with his, uh, the screen, so to speak. Is Moses historically a man also? Yes, he's a, historically a man. He's also a principal. Uh, but historically, everything in the Torah is also historically true. It's not that um, it's only symbolic or only uh, a, a spiritual principle. Both of, the, both of them are true. Okay, so. Um, Now, could the veil mean that, uh, that's an interesting question, could the veil mean that we should keep our relationship with God veiled and only reveal the light of Torah we have received? Um, that, to a certain extent, is also true, but that's not the main point, I think, over here. Over here, the main point is that there's two ways of relating to God. One way of relating to God is through the transcendent re a relationship, a transcendent relationship, one that transcends time and space. And then there's a relationship of God in the world, that the world itself has a purpose, and the world itself is, is there not as a, uh, not to screen or to block out godliness, but as a veil through which we have to sort of move aside so that we can see the godliness within the world as well. The intention of giving the Torah, when God gave the Torah, the intention was that that, supernal revelation, the transcendent revelation, 
would be constant and for all for all time and for uh, and 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 everywhere. That was the intention. But because of the golden calf, it didn't happen that way. Therefore, we have to oscillate between these two methods of finding godliness in the transcendent aspect, i.e. in the Torah, in prayer, in meditation, in Kabbalah, and the other method within creation, within events that happen, within we see the divine guiding hand behind events, and then we understand that these are there's godliness hidden in this too. Um, yes, the light is shining so bright you wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to look at it directly. That's like looking at the sun, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it doesn't equate to general specific providence necessarily. No, uh, general providence is at least in the in Maimonides' terminology, is the providence that covers all the rest of the world except human beings. Uh, but it has more to do with linear and circular spherot. Yes, it does. Transcendence and imminence. Yes, that's right. Going up and going inward. Or rather going upward and inward as opposed to going outward. Uh, if you remember in a previous lecture, we called these two types of chokhmah. There's the chokhmah of creation, the wisdom in creation, the revelation within creation. There's a revelation that transcends creation. Chokhmah of Torah and chokhmah ma'aseh brishit. Chokhmah of creation. Um, is this what the Baal Shem Tov was teaching that everything we experience here see is Ashkacha Pratit, discovery of God? Yes, absolutely. That is the God within nature, that's the veiled godliness. Uh, but we can come to understand godliness through that too, and that's the point of the veil. Okay, any other questions? <laughs>